All right, uh, welcome to Story Comic Presents, where we interview amazing storytellers and artists. This is episode 44. And with us is Jay Lichtenauer, owner of the premier old time radio station, ABN Antioch Old Time Radio. And Jay, I'm really happy that you're here. Uh, we mentioned before we went on the air that I've been, I've been listening to the radio station for well over a decade. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been it's been my it's been my companion through you know many countries as I worked overseas, uh, and learned a lot and I had a really created a, a great passion and understanding and and uh, a big fan of, um, you know this basically this lost art of of radio serials and radio programs mm -hmm. that you know it's it's you know that we've seen it kind of fall apart a bit with you know the advent of the television, and <laughs> and and I. I and so, you know, before we get started, and like I said, I have a lot of questions we want to talk about, you know, we want to talk about, you know, how you got your radio station started, some of your programs that you, that you, that you've done and, um, and, you know, some of the science fiction, some of the sci, the, the sci-fi shows that you have on there. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, we mentioned, you know, through email, we could talk a little bit about Superman as well, the Superman mm -hmm. radio program that you have. Um, but before we jump right into it and, and talk, let's, um, I wanted to, uh, First, kind of have uh, have our viewers and listeners kind of get introduced to to you, Jay, and also we'll talk a little bit about your history of how you created your radio station. Okay. So, um, I think the probably the best way to put this would be to uh, go into the background of how I grew up as a kid, and um, for some reason, my parents, probably my dad, mostly. Uh, bought me audio equipment without me asking for it. And so I ended up with record player after record player, uh, a Donald Duck radio when I was six, a um, uh, tape recorder and uh, uh, a stereo uh, 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 for uh, playing phonographs uh, when I was eight. And it just went on and on from there. Um, I have a great story about my, my poor Donald Duck radio. And, and of course, I was a tinkerer too. I was wiring things together. They got me electronic sets and... Uh, shortwave radio, um, but I never became a ham during all that time, but I knew about it. So um, so I was listening to the radio quite a bit, and I was tuning into things like uh, people's, actually cell phones, believe it or not, in the early 80s, um, which I, I had no idea what was going on back then. I had to find out later when I became a ham later uh, in later years. Um, but anyway, going way, way back um, to when I was six, I had this Donald Duck radio, and it has the uh, the nine volt uh, battery uh, clip on it, and I guess from too much taking the battery cover off, uh, I I broke the wires on it. Okay, so I was a little bit ashamed of that. I should have taken it to my dad. I didn't. I thought, ah, uh, I'll find a way to make this work. So I took the black and the red wire, and I tried plugging them into the electric outlet. <laughs> Boom. Okay. <laughs> The breakers blew. I got in big trouble. There were black marks on things. And uh, yeah, that made it an indelible uh, memory in, uh, in my head for at age six. So that was the end of that. It was probably five, age five or six. So, but um, so as I kept acquiring more and more audio stuff, and I was listening to records, I, I bought my first singles when I was six. I had golden records from my, uh, from my mom that I would play. But I would listen to the radio quite a bit, and I had uh, a desk, um, a child's desk with a, a log, and I would log everything I heard on the radio. I was always looking around for things. Well, one of the things I found, which I found fascinating, was um, uh, it, it was an NPR station. It was in Washington, D.C., um, and uh, American University, actually, and they were playing uh, old-time radio and uh, modern drama. And I thought, whoa. I can't have a TV in my room, but I can, I can actually hear stories in my room. You know, this is portable, um, uh, actual stories now. Um, so I got kind of got hooked on that. And even before that, it was fascinating even because even when I was about six years old, kids in the neighborhood would talk about, Hey, the Lone Ranger is going to be on the radio. I said, Oh, I can listen to that in any room. I can listen to that in my bedroom. This was, I don't know, a point of fascination for me to be able to listen to this stuff. By the time I was 12 or 13, I was doing, I have been doing recording since I was a little kid, eight or eight years old or so. But I, uh, uh, let's see, in seventh grade, 
all the kids uh, in the school, or a lot of kids in schools, have these stereo boom boxes, and I wanted a, a a radio like that, but I was too timid to ask for a uh, a stereo box. And my parents said, "Would you like, you know, a stereo box? Do you have to have a stereo box or a mono box?" And I went, "You know, more timid. I'm like, I'll I'll have a mono box. You know, I didn't want to ask for too much, and that's what I got. Well, that doesn't lend itself to music quite the same way. So, uh, so I had that, and I'm recording this these uh. Uh, old time radio and uh, newer dramas like um, Jack Flanders, uh, Tower of Inverness, um, but other stuff like Sherlock Holmes and The Great Gildersleeve onto cassette tapes. And I would take these to school. And at recess, other kids would be around with their boom boxes listening to ACDC, Van Halen, you know, all that stuff. Uh, I was listening to Jack Flanders. And uh, and, and I had a teeny bit of a following, like a couple other nerdy kids would uh, kind of go along with me on that and enjoy that. Um, and that's about as far as it went. Um, after I was about 13 or 14, I moved on to other interests like, you know, the Commodore 64 and programming and that sort of thing. And then on to cars and so on and so forth. So I revisit this really. Um, I, I become a ham in 2002 and I'm at a ham fest, um, and I say, "Whoa, antique radios! I, I th you know, when you see them in the uh, in the antique shops, they're like over a hundred dollars. You know, they're like fifteen dollars here. Okay, maybe they're not perfectly pretty, but they're electronically working. Well, yeah, because you're at a ham fest, and you have a whole bunch of people who hams, amateur radio people who fix things. They're not going to. Well, they might sell you something broken, but most of the time." What's on the table is something that they've already at least electronically restored. And so ah, I can get that for $15. Okay, cool. So I got a Stromberg Carlson Bakelite radio and brought it home and, you know, tune around and listening on the dial link. You know what? The content on AM radio does not match the period of this radio. <laughs> so I went out and um, researched on and found, oh, you can buy MP3 uh, old time radio wow, all these shows. And I, some of them I remembered. And I, so I started buying uh, MP3 CDs and bringing them in. I said, okay, I'm going to put this on this older Mac that uh, I've decommissioned for things. And I'm going to have iTunes play it. And I'll use this iTunes calendar software that's out there um, to actually play different programs at different times. Um, well, there's another part to that. I had to buy, I had to uh, build an AM transmitter as well to hook up to that. So I, I bought a Vectronix kit, which I soldered the whole thing together. I ended up going through about five different um, AM transmitters until I was satisfied with the audio quality and the signal. And I think I ended up with an AM range master, which cost me about a grand. <laughs> so, uh, and it's hate, it's still working. And I bought that in 2003 and it's still working. So, um, but then uh, about the same time, uh, we got broadband internet. It was slow DSL. And uh, I thought, oh, you know, I see these other people who are doing this. And I was listening to music. You know, this is about the time. I guess the music, the streaming music was really getting pretty big at this time. And I saw old time radio stations. Oh, I can do that, too. So I set up a stream and allowed up to eight listeners. And... Um, and I'm looking at, well, some of these other streams are getting as many as 30 or 32 listeners. Those are the biggest stations at that time in this, in this genre. And uh, I thought, oh, if I could just be that big, you know, 32 listeners. Um, and so that's what I started striving for. And in my attempt to strive for that, I thought, you know what I can do? I can do better than them in that I can get better audio quality to begin with because I'm finding out there is better audio quality out there. It costs more. You have to go find it. Um, you know, the stuff that's out there for free can sometimes be garbage. And I really hated it when I was running this station. And, you know, you, you throw a few hundred MP3s in there and they play and then they have all kinds of problems with, like, with them. Like they're murky. They're too fast. Mm -hmm. There's an AOL uh, login sound that got recorded in with it. Um you know, all these problems. And that's where I started getting into, uh, I need to get quality. And that's what I concentrated on from then on is uh, acquiring quality. So, and I think going, I was moderately working on that from uh, through the 2000s. And um, I got bigger and bigger into it as we came along into 2015. Um, 
uh, well, there's there's actually um, another another part to that because uh, one of my friends uh, who is ham radio operator, who's uh, oh, most of these people are considerably older than me, and some of them are passing away now. Uh, he fixed uh, antique radios, and he helped me uh, fix antique radios. And I'd get on with him. You know, he lived one town away, and we get on the radio and go back and forth. And he taught me how to fix things, or he had parts that he was, you know, ready to just drive over to my house and deliver to me and give them to me for free. And uh, he was just so thrilled that someone had taken up this uh, this hobby. He was a TV repairman uh, uh, originally, and he had about 150 antique radios themselves and he would go to meets and trade and sell uh these uh these antique radios and uh so um he uh said hey you're into old time radio he you know um i know this guy i used to, was actually a neighbor of mine who's older than me i used to hear him coming through because he was just a couple blocks away from me on 160 meters amateur radio band and um he has been collecting old time radio since he was a kid. Hmm. Uh, so he, he had been listening in the 1940s, I believe. Uh, he may have been about 12 years old or something like that when he got his first tape recorder. I may be a little off on that, but I think I know when he was born and I want know when his first tapes were made. Um, so he um, was actually recording on the original, I guess, Ampex uh, recorders uh, that Bing Crosby and Ampex put out, probably around 47 or 48. So he might have gotten in, the, in that period of time. And talking to him, he said, yeah, back then when we were recording on tape, the first tapes were actually paper. They weren't, um, you know, plastic or PVC or whatever they're made out of. They were on paper. They were iron oxide on paper. Wow. And I went to his I went to visit him at, at his house one time because I was going to borrow some reels. I'm looking for quality. And he says, hey, I, I have that. We just have to search all over his house for it. And uh, so, yeah, he had reels in like every room, you know. Uh, and uh, he said, oh, well, let me find that paper, you know, that paper. So he showed it to me. I'm like, wow, that's amazing. He said, yeah, I made a, a, a duplicate of it in 1990. And uh, so I have that uh, that tape now. So... Um, so I would go down there, borrow some tapes from him and then return them. And I thought to myself, you know, when he passes away, who's going to get all this stuff and do stuff with us? Because all he does is records. Hmm. He never really listens to any of his collection and he's getting up near 80. How is he ever going to listen to any of this stuff? He went on to keep recording TV shows and collecting DVDs and VHS tapes. And it just, it just went on forever with him. So, um, but another funny, th uh, interesting thing about him too is, so as he got into his teens, he wanted to keep recording shows. He was recording right off the air in Chicago and he sometimes would actually want to go out and socialize with people, you know, when he's 15 or 16 years old, but he wanted to record X minus one, the science fiction radio program that was on, I guess about 1956 or so. And so what he did is he, being a ham radio guy, uh, he he devised a refrigerator defrost timer as a household timer to turn on the uh, uh, tape deck and record X, X minus one while he was out with his friends. Oh, wow. So, uh, so he has, you know, created, I think, about 7,000 uh, reel-to-reel tapes or, you know, traded, collected over the years. And, um, uh, he, he was collecting, um, and talking to other ham radio people in the 1960s and probably the fifties about this. Um, oh, I have another thing. <laughs> he, um, he has one of the, uh, few recordings of the uh, Sputnik going overhead when he was in college, I guess in the 1950s, he was the only person on the university of Illinois, uh, campus, uh, to have a tape deck. And he was on the other side of the campus and people knew about him and his tape recorder. And they said, we, we need this for our study of Sputnik going over and figuring things out. And uh, he got very involved with that. Unfortunately, it hurt his studies. But uh, that story is actually on YouTube. You can look for that. Uh, his name is Ken Poletic. And uh, there's a recording of an interview of him on YouTube in two parts uh, that was done at a ham fest about 
25 years ago or something like that. It's a very entertaining story about uh, recording the Sputnik. So um, in Ken's talking to people, he finds other people um, who like uh, old time radio and uh, uh, he starts uh, trading with them. Eventually, we get to the point where they actually form a little bit, a bit of a group. There are now three people. They get together on a particular day of the week, and uh, they talk about what they're going to buy from dealers, and they're going to start trading. And they, they start giving them, eventually, they give themselves the names uh, ORCATS, Old Time Radio Collectors and Traders Society. Um, and eventually, it gets organized, and it gets something like 30-plus members to it. And basically, people would just buy from dealers, and then they would rotate uh, these reels around. And eventually, it, it took like a year be, by, from somebody buying a reel before it got around to everybody. But you had something like 50-plus reels going around the group in a year or more. So this, this collection went on. One of the founding members of the uh, Orcats, uh, his name is Larry, and he was out in Ohio. Um, so he, he got started right at the beginning. And um, uh, I guess what happened is uh, recently uh, Ken passed away, but before that happened, he had a stroke. And um, I was kind of concerned about what's going to happen to his real collection. And um, uh, Larry says, uh, you, you want a real collection? I've been trying to get rid of mine. Nobody will take it. I said, what? <laughs> you, you, your collection goes all the way back to 1971? You know, he's doing 1971. They probably stopped doing it at about 2003 or somewhere around there, maybe 2004. They're doing their last reels. And because things are getting more digital at that point and the Orcats get a hard drive at that point, which I acquired in 2015. So I still have that to go through. It's huge. And uh, he says, yeah, you can come out and uh, just pick them up. I'm like, okay, how many do you think you have? Well, you know, we figured about 2000. Okay. So I took some of the reels I had. I, I got 10% of uh, Ken's collection of his um, 7,000 uh, that were in storage. Um, and um, uh, because the rest actually were sort of damaged in a flood at his house. I guess there was a pipe burst in his house. And he was uh, at his vacation home in the south. And all of these... Um, uh, Tapes actually got, uh, uh, well, the, the, the indexes to them got destroyed. So they're all mystery tapes now. Larry's collection is fully cataloged and indexed. And I thought, oh, this is great. It goes back to the beginning of Orcats, and uh, it's 2,000 reels. So I took one of Ken's reels, and I, I, I took a few of them and put them on a scale and uh, to see how much they weigh. And uh, they, they weigh uh, three quarters of a pound. I said, okay, 2,000 reels. It's going to be 1,500 pounds. Can my van handle that? <laughs> so I had the suspension worked on uh, in the van because uh, it was kind of rattling around a little bit. Um, uh, my son and I, who's also a ham, uh, KD9BUD, I'm KC9AYH, um, went out uh, to uh, pick him up from Larry. And uh, it was an all-day adventure. We did everything in the same day. We went all the way from Chicago area out to eastern Ohio and uh, brought them all back. And I'll tell you, going down the uh, Ohio and Indiana turnpike, and you hit those bridges with those really hard bumps, mm. this thing was bottoming out. I, uh, needless to say, I had to have the suspension fixed again right after that trip. So, <laughs> um, but, yep, uh, parked the van in the driveway uh, and, uh, said, I'm, you know, I'm so beat. I'm going to go in and, uh, we'll come back out in the morning when, you know, the family will unload it and we'll, uh, put it in the basement and on new shelves and everything. And, and now it's like, uh, it's just the most amazing thing for me to sit here and go, Hmm, what could need some work right now? Uh, that is in poor quality. And I go back to the uh, card catalog b back behind me. The card catalog is all organized by program. So if you have a particular interest in a program like the Great Gilder Sleeve or the Shadow or uh, whatever, you can go in there and get a, a bunch of index cards like at the library and it tells you what all the real numbers are and what the episodes are and what their dates are and what the names are. Uh, if you want to go out at the uh, other angle, like, you know, the reels from the, uh, the 800s through the 1000s are, are on really good tape stock. 
I wonder what's on them. I can actually go uh, in another ca card catalog where uh, I can find out what's on all the reels from 900 to 1,000 and just flip through those and go through, oh, wow, and discover new things on there. And with those numbers in my head, I go back in the back library room, pull the reels, bring them in here, put them on the deck, um, and just uh, start digitizing them. Uh, digitize them into Apple Lossless. And uh, right. I've been cutting episodes like that for uh, for the past two years as I have time. And so let me pull up um, your your website here real quick. And it kind of shows you the list of all your, all your shows that you do. Mm -hmm. Now, so... When you when you go through these you know, these back catalogs you haven't discovered, how often? I mean, for you as, as part of the radio station, how how many of how many of the shows that you have are I would I don't say like radio station worthy, or how many of them? Because if you do you have do you want to make sure you have at least a library of like ten or twenty? How does that work? Where you decide that that you put them on the stream? Yeah, so I don't make a whole lot of judgments as to the um, the writing quality and acting quality necessarily. Um, sometimes they get complaints about, well, why do you have that show on? That's crummy. That's, I, I just give a good survey as an archivist of what played back then. Uh, so uh, mostly I want to play things that are going to make them enjoyable, uh, not too challenging. Um, there are sometimes uh, some programs where the stories are so compelling and there just is an audio that's perfect enough out there. I'm just going to do the best I can. And you're going to have to suffer a little bit with uh, uh, clicks and crackle and noisy discs um, uh, to get through the story. But for the most part, I'm just trying to get the best audio possible. Are you, are, is it, are you the only station that has... That has Magic Island, or is there any other stations that have that? Oh, I'm sure others do. Um, well, part of the thing about programming is when I programmed this, I decided to do categories, which I didn't really see anybody else doing at the time. Mm. I thought, I'm just going to follow some of the other rules I see in the industry about how we do things um, and start picking times, you know, like midnight. I do the mystery and thrillers. I do it midnight. I mean... Things like uh, murder at midnight, you know, that should be at midnight central time here. Um, but, uh, but then once I started categorizing things like that, I said, you know what? I need to run the serials in order, uh, not randomly, in order, um, and at a predictable time of day on a schedule. Otherwise, people aren't going to be able to follow the story. Um, the, you'd have to own the collection and go through it yourself at that point. If we're going to play it on a station, it's got to be done this way. Um, so I do have a friend who's using the same software, uh, as I am the software I created, uh, uh to run this station, who's running his station out in Georgia. Uh, but he's not using all the features that, um, that I've developed yet. He just hasn't done all the voice work for it. So. And so talk to us a bit about, I mean, is that when, so when you put these together now, is there in the OTR world and the old time radio world is it, with the stations, are you competitors and collaborators at the same time? Or how does that work when you hear, like, for instance, do you have shows that you have that you've been able to save that would you consider from the, from the ABN network, like these are kind of proprietary or if somebody from another station calls them and says, Hey, can I have a copy of that? How does that work? Yeah. Um, it was a lot more competitive before there was actually quite a market for buying old time radio. And there was a lot of respect that if you bought something from somebody, you didn't have the rights to go distributing it for free to anybody else. There was just sort of that honor uh, going on. But over the past 20 years, uh, I've watched that these markets have sort of dried up as more and more uh, higher quality uh, versions are starting to show up for free uh, through OTRR, uh, Old Time Radio Researchers Group, uh, on archive.org. Um, and there's a little more openness with people volunteering and the business model is starting to dry up a little bit. So, see, the business model goes way, way back. Um, it goes back into the 1960s where uh, there were old time radio dealers 
uh, in the 1960s, 1970s, 80s, 90s reels, and then they went to cassettes. They had conventions. Uh, they traveled long distances for these, like Friends of Old Time Radio on the East Coast, Spurred Vac, uh, I don't remember exactly what that stands for, on the West Coast. They're still putting things together, presentations and all that. And they would have dealer tables there where they would have books. There are lots of books on, on these things. That's where the real historians, uh, they're, they do big, big research. Um, I, I'm friendly with some of those people. Um, so for the most part, uh, I've been taking what I've acquired now from these new sources, the Orcats and the reels I have, and just putting them into my own for myself for right now. I have offered, in some cases, in the case of uh, the, sh the program Let George Do It, which is a, a precursor to yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Uh, well, it's sort of a precursor because Bob Bailey, I think of it that way, but Bob Bailey starred in it. The versions that were digital on the internet and from dealers even who were selling this stuff had these digital hiccups in them. And I looked at the files and they were all encoded in 1999 and 2000. And whatever the encoder was, um, I don't know, it, they misused the bit reservoir and the MP3 encoder. And in the middle, I go chirp, chirp, you know, um, and I can't play audio like that. It sounds awful. Mm. So I could not find a better copy of Let George Do It Anywhere. When I got Larry's Reels from Ohio, I, that was one of my targets early on. Let's see if we can get a better copy of Let George Do It. We're going to target the things that are a problem out there where I cannot find a good copy anywhere out there. So I encoded everything uh, from the real collection for Let George Do It, and I ended up, I think, replacing about two-thirds of it. And I, I, most of it is now uh, playable. We went from having maybe 30 or 40 episodes playable to a couple hundred playable now uh, that I digitized them from Reels. And I thought, you know what? This could be my contribution back to uh, OTRR. I've, I haven't worked that out yet with them for some reason. I don't know. It's very hard to give things away sometimes, but I'm getting more friendly and personable um, with uh, relationships with uh, some of these people now um, so that some of this will actually get uh, uh, shared out there as well for people to enjoy on their own time. And is there, out of the, out of the shows, is, is, do you have, is there any, um, how hard, I guess my question is how hard is it to, or easy is it to have an entire series run or there's always episodes that are missing and you just have to live with it because they're so hard to find. How does that work? It all depends. Um, there are some things that are complete and there's some things that are very sparse and they're just different history reasons for that. So, um, uh, some that come to mind, uh, are, uh, the Great Gildersleeve and Fibber McGee and Molly, um, the sponsors kept copies. In the case of Lux Radio Theater, uh, Cecil B. DeMille kept a perfect copy on disc. So all of us, that stuff. Now, did any, did the public get this necessarily? Yeah, in some cases they did, in some cases they did not. There are other series I've had a really hard time with, like uh, George Burns and Gracie Allen. Mm. This is really hard to find stuff. Um, where we have uh, something like 80 or 90%, let's say, of Fibber, McGee, and Molly are uh, very close to the same percentage of Gildersleeve, uh, I can only find 10% of Burns and Allen. Wow. I don't know. Um, other reasons uh, f f we didn't have some of these uh, transcri transcription discs survive, that was the only way to actually store things at that time, um, besides maybe... Uh, uh, wire recorders, which are awful audio before the tape recorders came along in the late 40s. Um, during World War II, um, the materials uh, for the discs were, I guess, in short supply and needed. So a lot of the recordings were not kept or were destroyed uh, in the 1940s. Uh, Superman is a good uh, case of that. We have a very complete uh, run of Superman from its inception in 1940 until the war hits and you get a little bit into the war and it's okay. And then all of a sudden it's just, there's almost nothing there. And as soon as the war is over, all the episodes come back. So we're missing all these great episodes, apparently of Superman fighting the Nazis 
There's uh, mm-hmm. unless somebody made a home recording of it, uh, you know, in some unconventional way, there are not good recordings of that stuff. So, is there any places like it's the OTR world that you know there are copies of things that you just can't access because of family reasons or yeah, anything like that? Yeah. And as people are getting older, um, this is going to change. More things are going to be coming out and they are coming out very, uh, I think very quickly right now, because the first generation of people who were collecting this stuff are just now uh, passing away and uh, they're going, you know, their collections are going places. Um, So that just happened. A couple of those happened this year. Um, uh, there, there are a lot of private collections yet that have not made it into the public uh, domain or when I say pu- not public domain, cause that's, but um, uh, general circulation, I should say. Um, so there, we're going to see more. Uh, some things were entered into the library of Congress. Other collections were don- donated to a university. And the only way to hear it is, you know, to go to the university and have special access. Um, in the case of a show like quiet, please, that's kind of a really interesting story in and of itself. Uh, during the 1960s and 70s, it was believed that only about 13 Quiet uh, Please episodes existed, or about 10% or so of the collection. And then somebody discovered about 80 discs or so. I'm fudging the numbers a little bit because I can't remember exactly. And that became kind of a really popular thing. But there's still an episode or two that are in a private collection that the only way you can hear it is to go in and put a little earplug in, and I don't remember where this is, but put an earplug in, and they check you to make sure you don't have any recording equipment with you. And that's the only way to hear it. So uh, eventually this stuff is all going to get freed up. It's happening. Right. So what, out of, out of all the, so the, the shows that you have, out of those shows, which ones are, how would you compare it for, for the, for the, for the, the amateur OTR person, someone who wants to start listening to old time radio, uh, what percent? What percentage of the shows that are out there do you have on your schedule? Um, is there a list of shows that that um, Antioch Old Time Radio just doesn't have that other stations have? Or probably, um, I probably have things in better quality than a lot of other places because I'm so uh, original sources. Um, I merge things together, you know, like somebody has a really good, uh, collection somewhere. Well, I buy from him or acquire from him and then I go to another source. In some cases, I think, uh, with the Whistler, for instance, which is one of my favorite programs, very entertaining, uh, mystery program, surprise endings every time that my wife is pretty good at figuring some of it out, but I never do. And that I have such a poor memory that I forget the endings so I can enjoy them a thousand times over. It takes me a long time to memorize the endings. So I'm going to enjoy this for a really long time. I was collecting that. I think I'm up to 15 different sources merged together. Um, and even when I get them from other people, I still have to edit them a lot of times for time. Um, a lot of people leave hum in hum is so easy to remove properly. Um, and, and trim the ends. Um, so that we don't have a whole bunch of dead roll, uh, on either side of it, you know, for broadcast, you know, you have to uh, fix all these things up and uh, and make it work. Um, so I have a, a a mixture, I would say, of um, some rarities maybe that are are hard to find, but mostly the rarities are rare quality. Uh, you know, that's that's going to be really tough to find. My Superman collection right now is, I don't know anybody who has a better Superman collection. Mm. Uh, you know, so it just doesn't exist. I'm blown away by hundreds and hundreds of episodes. I have far better audio quality. And so, but is there, and so I guess my other, the the other question too, is just, is that you get, it's, I think Jack Benny would probably be the only one where you can actually, you don't get the jokes because some of them are just like current event kind of stuff Mm -hmm. on there. And, but it's it's what I love about listening to these the, the shows, whether they the, the comedy or the or the science fiction or the thrillers, it it transports you into that time where mm-hmm. it's it. Oh, for instance, what was the one that I really liked? It was the uh, what's the one that's basically like it was the radio version of Cops, where they just followed people, they followed police. Oh, um, Night Watch. 
Okay. Nightwatch. Okay. Yeah, yeah. that's from 19, uh, early 50s, I think 1954 or something like that. Yeah, that was a big surprise, too. I had no idea that they, they did that, but they had portable recorders, and they could do that. Yeah. Um, one of the neat things, and that's hard to get a good audio quality on that, and it really does break from all the other police drama. You know, I mean, Dragnet's really good. Um, te uh, Tales of the Texas Rangers are really good. Night Watch is, um, it's really a, it's a voyeuristic type program in a way, you know? Um, so it doesn't quite fit in with the whole theme of old time radio that much, but I thought it was so unique and interesting. I had to include it. One of the neat things about that program is I, when they, I, I have evidence of how they actually edit that show. They do raw recordings out there, but when you hear the, the narrator describing what's happening for you, he's not actually describing it on scene. They did that in post oh, in post wow. edit, but he's still being very quiet as if he were on the scene. He says, all right, the suspect is now, you know, so he'll be he'll kind of whisper as if he's right there. They did it all in post. Oh, wow. The other funny thing is people had some pretty foul mouths back in 1954. Right. They used all the words. Those get edited out. So I have, I have raw recordings of the, um, the, the raw recordings of, you know, before all the post-production work, I have a couple of those. That's, that was really revealing. Is there any, is in, in the OTR world, is there any Holy grail of shows or episodes that everybody's like, what, you know, like when you go to, you know, you know, I imagine like, you know, like 20 years ago and you had these conventions like, Hey, do you have this episode of this or that episode of that? Is there one that, that everybody's always trying to look for? Yeah, um, I I think people are trying to finish uh, and get a complete version of suspense. Um, I, I can't think of any one particular thing. I mean, uh, not there. I'm sure there are people that are looking for things, but I nothing stands out uh, at me at this point. But I I know collectors really would like to finish off suspense. Um they do end up finding that they can get at least the scripts for these programs uh, will end up in certain um, institutions like universities that they can go visit and copy the scripts. Um, uh, those are usually on the West Coast because most of these programs were made on the West Coast after the uh, late 1930s. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody moved out to Hollywood um, uh, to get more uh, Hollywood talent, I guess, at that time. So all those scripts are out there, but... Um, yeah, I, 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 what comes to mind is, uh, suspense. I, they're probably, I would like to get a complete whistler. Um, the whistler was mostly a West coast show. Um, but it also had a Chicago show that was broadcast from WBBM from the Wrigley building. And, uh, they used Chicago, uh, actors to uh, redo the thing. And then they used a live audience, which was really strange to hear people clapping after the show. You've never heard that sort of thing before. And it was, uh, it was sponsored by Meisterbrow. And, um, they, they actually g had a deal to, um, some sort of financial deal to get the scripts and they got the music cues as well. They had the original music from the, the West coast whistler, um, and then they just use their own actors at that point. Um, and, uh, so, uh, 80% or something like that of the West coast is preserved, but only maybe 10% or 5% of a uh, series that ran for a year or two in Chicago or, um, you know, basically East coast versions that were syndicated across a few more stations. Only 10% of those exist. I, there's nothing we can do about it, you know? And all the radio that goes back before things were really being recorded, like the uh, first few hundred Lone Rangers, you know, we're, we're just never going to hear them. It's very fortunate. In the case of the Lone Ranger, they, I think they would actually, because it was live in the early 30s, they would act it out three times over for different audiences. Oh, wow. They got tired of doing that. So as soon as they could record, which I think is probably 1937 or so, they record once and then play back two more times. It's, it's not, uh, and and it, that's important. Yeah, it's oh. important because that's how we ended up actually having those programs if it weren't for that. So a lot, everything before that time is gone. Wow. 
So is like is the witch's tale? Is that like your oldest show then? <laughs> oh, that is really old, isn't it? Nineteen. <laughs> I think it was like thirty nineteen thirty two. I have to look yeah. to see how far back that goes. Yeah, that's a really creepy sounding thing altogether. Yeah, I think that's. I I would I would think that would probably be your oldest show. It, I I. Th I, uh, calling all cars goes back quite a ways too. Okay. I can check that in a second here too. Um, but I think you got it right. Yeah. Um, my earliest episode of the witch's tale is called the gypsy's hand. They're, uh, from 1932, April 14th of 1932. So you're right. That sounds right. Okay. And do you know any, I would just, uh, the, uh, Harold Perry show. That was a, that was a, prequel almost to the great gildersleeve but even great gildersleeve though was a spinoff of, of okay uh, that was a spinoff of faber Binky and molly right yeah okay yeah in part yes um so a few different uh, shows uh, were spawned from faber Binky and molly and i'm not going to remember them all but we'll stick with gildersleeve for right now listening to gildersleeve interact on faber Binky and molly is hilarious yeah. he's much more of a comical uh, character on there. Fibber McGee and Molly's terrific because they would sort of name their characters after who they were. Um, you know, it just start, starting with Fibber because he was a liar and uh, uh, um, I, I can't remember. It's, uh, Jim, um, yeah, I think it was Jim Jordan, Jim and Miriam Jordan. Jim Jordan actually won the Liars Club Award up near my area, just up the street from me in Burlington, Wisconsin, back in the 1930s. So, yeah, Gildersleeve came out of that. Harold Perry was the first Gildersleeve. And um, he had a friend named uh, Willard Waterman who, yeah, they were friends. And I think the story went something like um, one of the networks that had the great Gildersleeve decided to uh, basically buy Harold Perry. Okay. And what they their their flaw was is they didn't get the Gildersleeve show with it, okay. <laughs> so they only ended up with Harold Perry. So they had to start a Harold Perry show, which was a different thing. And the oh, Gildersleeve okay. show continued on. And Harold Perry's good friend Willard Waterman, who could sound pretty identical to Harold Perry, which is amazing because it's a distinct voice character. But these two guys could do it the same way. So Willard Waterman continued on with the Great Gildersleeve while Harold Perry went off. On the on the side on a different network with uh, the Harold Perry show, because there sounds like there's there's some same actors that were on the Harold Perry show that were also on the Great Gildersleeve. It seemed like as well. It could be. Yeah. Okay. So that was all right. Oh, there was a lot of cross pollination, and that is so fun when you have distinct voices and you're like, "What's this guy doing on this show?" Suspense right. is great for that when you have comedy actors uh, like right. Jack Benny show up on Suspense. Some of the best stuff. And Agnes really Moorhead seems to be like in a lot of shows as well. Yeah. See, that that's like um, overhyped, I think, at that point, because it's needs to be so big. But I, it was good. There's no doubt it was good. But it, I'm not just a collector. I'm a listener. I have been listening. I, I can't go to sleep without listening, pretty much. I, I put an earbud in and lay down and I just, you know, listen and let it uh, take me to sleep. And I've been doing that for 17 years. And they just, you just had on today, the, it was a, what was it, a Matt, was a Matt, no, mystery and thriller? I can't, I think it was, a, it was a suspense, episode of suspense about the rats. The oh, yeah, uh, Three Skeleton Key. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's probably a classic piece of uh, uh, literature, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that was like done you, a few times on suspense. Yeah, that was a, that was a, that was a pretty good one. I don't know if you heard the one before that, did you? I must have. I was been listening to it all day. I Which one? It was the imposters. Oh, is that the one where they uh, they killed the same people who were killed? Yeah, that was an earlier? awesome plot. Yes, that was yeah. great. Yeah. So. There was so many. There was actually. It's amazing to see. Do you see also? I'm just kind of curious as well. Is like, uh, there's so many good seeds. There's so many good story seeds for people that want to. Because all this now is basically public domain too, right? These stories. Almost all of it. There are a few cases where um, people have renewed things that you you can't do. The Shadow, I, I have no, I'm not allowed to play that. They they went after me illegally on that. The Tiny Stations, they'll leave alone. They go below the radar, but I'm so big, I get targeted for anything. 
um, that I try to play. Um, so there, there are a few series I, I, I can't play. Very few, thankfully. But you're right. Generally, most of it is public right now. No, the, the TV networks and the writers don't have any interest. They might be copyright, but nobody has an interest in uh, doing, you know, fighting that at all. There was there was an episode of I don't know if it was Dimension. It must have been Dimension X or X minus mm -hmm. one, one of those two. Yeah, where they actually try to make a TV show based off of that. I don't know. Did you see this? It was the one where the small uh, at the, the small it was drill was the name of that alien. Yes. Yeah. They yes. tried to make yes. a miniseries. It was on ABC. That uh -huh. was a complete like reimagining, not even reimagining, but just a retelling of that entire show. Okay. That, I didn't know that. I certainly know the story and it is a, it's a little, it's a, it's a, it's a chilling story really. Right yeah. about these little these these the, invisible aliens that can only be seen. Yeah, by and the kids children. are just are just playing, and to the adults, it's just a game. And you know, these kids they really really have vivid imaginations. Right. Yeah. And it, I actually it, I think it was it was the TV show that they were they were it was going to be an entire series, but it, and it got canceled the first season. Yeah. Or so, oh, but it oh. was. I was going to say a lot a lot of old time radio shows. I mean, when the when TV was coming of age. Um, they were thinking they would just take whatever old time radio show and just make a TV version of everything. And uh, there are Whistler TV shows. I didn't know this until about 10 years ago. I had no idea uh, what there was suspense was on TV. Lights out was on TV. Okay. Um, Jack Benny obviously went to TV. Burns and Allen went to TV. Fibber McGee and Molly couldn't go to TV because of uh, Marion Jer Jordan's health. And they went right. to a 15 minute, uh, 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 five days a week, uh, serial, but yeah, a ton of stuff went to TV and some of the, um, acting talent actually made their way to TV as well. Life of Riley. I think they kept most of the actors for that, believe it or not. That's right. Yeah. Um, yeah. father knows best. I think they might've, they might've changed some people in that around, but yeah, there are so many, so many of those things made it over there. Do you, and yeah, well, the Henry Aldrich was that was actually a comic book too. Was it okay? Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's a really good just uh, as a as a side note. There's, um, there's because you're a Mac person, I can tell mm -hmm. you this. So, uh, you got to keep the Mac in mind, you know, when you make yeah. the software. Um, they had there. There's a there's a it's an only an iOS app. You can't get it on uh, Android, but it's it's called Dime Comics, and okay. for you can get it for like three dollars you have seven thousand um golden age comic books from the 30s and 40s and 50s oh wow yeah and you basically have seven thousand eight thousand just right at your fingertips to to read them they're great on ipads uh, read them i don't need iPad. another hobby i i would be so <laughs> into that no I, old stuff like that i would be so yeah. into that yeah and so and that's yeah and it's it's, it's like the the app is free mm -hmm. but then you get these credits you can but for 399 it's unlimited you can watch you can read as many as you want hmm. and there's a, it's and there's so many of these like the sci-fi stuff there's so much of that stuff that's in there there's um but yeah mm -hmm. check it out now that i'll just <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah but yeah you put in your earbuds listen to that and then read a comic book from 1941 yeah. see well yeah. you know you know what's interesting though uh take a you ever see the uh tv show flash gordon yes it's, it's actually i mean my dad loved it you know my, my my parents were tv people they weren't radio people so they they don't even get this old time radio stuff that much you know they they, they were um uh growing up with uh tvs in their in their homes pretty early but my dad would, you know, go on about Flash Gordon. You go to watch it now, and it looks ridiculous, and the special effects are horrible. <laughs> I don't know that the stories are good or not. I don't know. Here's the thing. At the same time that's going on, how open and crazy and beautiful and uh, amazing was the world with uh, shows like X-1? Mm. Totally open. They could create any world whatsoever. I guess, you know, this needs some sound effects to support it. Right. Um, it I mean, it, it, it really kind of bridges the gap between um, uh, reading and, and TV and movies. Now, I know movies are going to keep getting better and better with visualizing this stuff. 
But at the time in the 1950s, you could go far more places and do far more things in radio. And it was very entertaining still. Um, another thing about serials too, is it's, it also bridges the gap between, um, you know, the movies versus the uh, uh, reading a book because in the, you know, let's say in the series Superman, they could make a story go as long as they wanted to. You could have five episodes of, of, of some plot, or you could have 25 or 32 episodes of a plot, whatever it took to get the story done. And do you see a, I mean, so where do you see now, like your, who's your audience that, cause you say on average, you'll have like, you know, maybe up to a thousand or so consecutive, you know, like uh, listeners. Do you see that it, it's still generational or do you see like a, a, a resurgence of, of, of old time radio now? I haven't done an age survey uh, in over 10 years. I probably should do that again and get a feel for where people are. I was thinking when I did the survey, I would get more people who lived in that period of time, but you know, they were only about 10% or so. Most of the people who are listening um, about 10 years ago were in their 50s and 60s. That's where the bulk of them were. I don't know the reason for that. Um, but it was sort of like a bell curve, and that's what it was. Another very interesting thing, I had a survey uh, uh, I did because I kept getting emails from people, and a lot of times they'd have call signs in there. They would be ham radio people. Okay. And this was going on for years and years, including people donating. So I did a survey on that. And again, it's voluntary who, who's answering the question, but 20% of the people who answered the question said, yeah, I'm a ham radio operator. Well, ham radio operators in the general population are only 0.2%. <laughs> so I've got a super over-representation of, of ham radio. I don't know. Just maybe people who are into audio to begin with, I guess. I don't know. But like you're saying at, at the beginning of the hour that you had, when you, you went to these ham radio conventions, people were selling antique radios. Yeah. So, yeah. But so you That's don't right. Know. Yep. Yeah. So it, do you, so I, you know, do you see, where do you see, I guess my question is somebody who is, um, you know, you're, you're, hum, you're a humble person, Jay, but I'm just going to say this. You're like, like a leader in the OTR world. Do you, where do you see um, old time radio as a hobby or a passion or as a, as a business in the, in, uh, in the future? Well, I think there's not going to be much monetary business with it to speak of anymore. I mean, I, I'm very, very thankful that I have uh, uh, people who are willing to uh, brunt the cost of all the operations here and the restoration work here. And eventually that's going to make it out into the public. Um, I do have my whole Superman collection for sale as MP3s and on a flash drive right now. Uh, but at some point in, in time, um, yeah, there's not going to be much of a, a, a market for that. And I have actually been wondering about this myself with, uh, if the, the demo that's listening to it is 10 years older than me still, um, are we going to have younger people picking up on this or not? I can only tell you anecdotally that if they're introduced to it at a young age, um, they love it. My, all my kids are pretty much grown now. Uh, but they have fond, fond memories of going through all of the cereals. Um, most of the kids, uh, their favorite cereal was Magic Island. One of them, it was Speed Gibson. And they would listen to episodes much faster than I could. So I gave them the job of actually reviewing the audio and gave them criteria to listen for. Let me know if there were any duds, bum audio, um, or problems with uh, anything. And they would do that for me, listen to it on their little MP3 players. Um, and, uh, yeah, my son at, uh, my son was, uh, in bed sick with croup or something like that when he was 10 or 11 years old and he wanted me to give him stuff to listen to. And he chose X minus <laughs> one. Can you imagine what that is like for an 11 year old mind, <laughs> you know? And, and after that, he was interested in things like twilight zone and all that, but he still thinks X minus one is one of the most creative things. You know, and it is because they had science fiction authors. They had Ray Bradbury and um, quite a few uh, names I can't remember right now um, who had already written these as short stories and published them and things. And X minus one was just picking up the absolute best of these stories and uh, recreating them, rewriting them for uh, radio. So it's 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 an incredible series. 
Yeah, there was that. I can't remember if it was Dimension X or X minus one. What was the one where they landed and uh, and they realized they were miniature? They were tiny. Oh well, there there was one where um, we're in communication. This is a great story. We're in communication with uh, an alien race that says they're coming to visit us. Right. But every time their signal came in, it was. It, it was condensed in a tiny little couple second burst and it was really high pitched and like, okay, well, when we slow this down, we can hear them talking to us. And of course it's in English, it's translated in English, but we have to slow it down every time it keeps coming in as these really fast bursts. And we invite them, we tell them, you know, where to land and we're going to have this friendly meeting and all this. And they say, okay, we're coming in, we're coming in. Hey, it's not quite as you described it. And they end up, uh, they probably end up a tiny thing in a mud puddle. And the reason the transmissions were so high pitched and fast is because they were very, very tiny themselves aliens. Yeah. And we guided them into disaster in some <laughs> marsh. <laughs> it was like a puddle, I gave yeah, away the story, but that, that just, it's one of those. And, and this is the beautiful thing with radio too, is there's so many surprise endings like that. It's like, who would have thought, you know, it was all going along fine. And then, like the last Martian. That's one of my favorite episodes okay. where the guy was a Martian and no one believed that he was a Martian. Yeah. 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 <laughs> that was another good one. So yeah. you know what? It was, you know, it's funny, Jay, is that uh, we've already, we've already done our hour. We didn't even get to talk about magic. Island magic Island. Yeah. yeah. But you know, that, that was, um, that, that really started with a lot of science fiction as well. You know, and I, you know, magnetic fog, I mean, such concepts that I thought in the 1930s, they're thinking of silent paint, meals and pellets, transparent steel and submarines, uh, remote control aircraft, uh, ray guns where you, um, everything is, uh, you know, measured in seconds. So a 300 second ray gun, they didn't want to talk about minutes. Everything had to be exact in seconds, very scientific community, um, that's a favorite among everyone I've presented it to. And do you, so one of the, one of the, uh, I don't know what, I don't want to say a criticism or one of the theories is that the, that lost had a lot of parallel storylines is magic Island. Did you, is, is there any part of that that you. I've heard that. And I haven't watched it. So, um, okay. yeah, I'm one of those really strange cultural anomalies that I don't think I've really watched too, too much. I didn't watch a whole lot of TV back, uh, in the eighties either. That was when I watched the most of it. I have no idea what's going on. I know the names of shows today. Um, but I, I should go watch that. I, I'm not saying there's bad, st th there is good stuff being presently made. Obviously. I just, I haven't had time for it. Right. So. I'm just deciding to have a different experience right. and there's so much of this other stuff, but I want to go, um, listen to and watch. So I'll, I, I'll go back and watch fifties and sixties uh, TV shows. And, right. but yeah, I, it, I, I think the other people have to comment on that. So, right. So, so where could, so, uh, so, so people can find you. It's radio.macandmind.com. Correct. Right. Mike Alpha Charlie, India November, Mike India no, November Delta dot com. That's when I had the Mac in mind. Uh, when I made this software. When I made this software, radio dot Mac in mind dot com is uh, the website. And you can stream right from the page. Uh, I actually built the page as a mobile uh, as well. So if you go to it on your Android or iPhone, you can play it right from there. The whole schedule is on there. Four days worth of scheduling is on there because I schedule about uh, two days ahead. And okay. publish that because people kept asking me what played, you know, before. And I have to answer all these emails. So I just said, it's easier for me to just put everything up there and I get less questions this way about uh, what was that thing that you played at four o'clock the other day? <laughs> yeah, it's it's right here. I would point them to the link. So. And you had. Yeah. And it's it's as I say, it's amazing because you you can you can listen to your station basically on you, any listening platform. You're on TuneIn, mm -hmm. you're on iTunes um spotify right i think you're on spotify i don't know yeah yeah, yeah. i'm not sure yeah. if i'm on itunes anymore though i think that went away so that went away yeah and mostly when i first heard you was was the internet yes. radio yes yeah. yeah i know for a fact um that uh even 
back in about uh, 2005 or so, uh, uh, well, when I first started, I was ha happy to have eight listeners and I thought saw the biggest stations had 32 listeners. When, as soon as I got listed on iTunes, my provider said, if we list you on iTunes, you need to bump up your uh, listening limits before you even list with them. Otherwise, we're not going to do it. Oh, wow. And I said, okay, how expensive is that going to be? Oh, it was going to be hundreds of dollars per month. Okay. Yeah. Or something like that. Uh, okay, let's go for it. We'll see what happens. And immediately, you know, like uh, the next day I had 160 listeners, oh, wow. you know, up from, up from 30. <laughs> and it just it grew like mad at that point. And I was paying for all this and the business is doing okay at this point. And I can pay for this. And I thought, boy, this is, this is a really expensive hobby paying for all the streaming. And, um, and people were like, how can I donate? I mean, people were just coming to me and emailing. So you don't have a place to donate. So I, it just all came about naturally that I said, okay, here you can donate. And right. uh, listeners have taken up the cause and uh, fully uh, funded the station for 15 years straight now. Wow. Cool. Mm -hmm. And then people, if, if people are willing, wanting to know, they, they can go to, uh, radio.macandmind.com and then the, there is a donate button right on there. Correct. Yeah. Right, right? Yeah. I yeah. think it says support, support. Yeah. Something like that. Yep. Right. Yep. There it is. But you know, support, yep. uh, only a certain number of people are going to donate and they realize that they're donating for other people to have free access to it. You know, mm -hmm. I didn't want to make an, you know, an app and then charge for it. And then, cause I know there are going to be people out there that, um, uh, you, d you just don't want to put an entrance fee to it. Right. So a certain group of people are going to help, um, sponsor it for a lot of exposure to a lot of other people. Right. Well, this has been great, Jay. That mm -hmm. has been great. I've, I've been, um, I've, I've been a fan of your station for over a decade and, uh, and this has been, and let's, if, you know, let's have you come back on and we'll talk about, uh, another time and we can talk about magic Island and really, yeah, we can go deep into that story. I've listened yeah. to that series four times over. Um, every time I got a better audio quality copy of that, I had to go and listen to it again to see if I can hear any more details in it. Wow. So, yeah. So, all right. Well, thanks a lot, Jay. And you're uh, welcome. And, and I say for those who want to check, you know, check out, uh, uh, Jay Lichtenauer's site it's uh you know abn old time radio it's at radio.macandmind.com and anywhere hours. yeah anywhere you want to search let's say on tune in or something like that you can just say play uh, uh antioch uh, otr is the code word antioch otr on tune in yeah and they'll play yeah <laughs> all right thanks a lot jay okay Well, and it's and also too like a little little trivia. You probably know this is that that's the first time Superman ever was with Batman was in the radio. That's right. Yeah, I think they, they appeared together in 1945, July of 1945. I could be wrong on that, but it surprised me. I was what? I had yeah, no yeah. idea. And it's great. Yeah. And it's not just like a one time thing. They uh, in later episodes, especially post war, um, there's a lot of story that Batman and Robin are in on the whole story. It's really neat. I love it. <laughs>